this week, it's all about Africa's preparedness to fight and control diseases that periodically pop up. The deadly Ebola virus has re-emerged, but governments and health officials are confident that they are better equipped to battle the spread of this new but mild strain. More about that coming up. Welcome to Wild of Africa, American Joker. The show starts right now. President Teodoro Obiang Gema of Equatorial Guinea has expressed an objectionable intention to contest the presidential election, thus paving the way for the 80-year-old leader's sixth term in office. The announcement caused an uproar from netizens across the continent and several European institutions demanding a free, fair and transparent election. A presidential poll in the separatist Somali region of Somaliland has been postponed for technical and financial reasons. Musa Bihi Abdi was elected president of the self-proclaimed republic on a five-year mandate in 2017 and the election was scheduled for November 13th this year, a month before his term expires. However, the electoral commission has now said that the poll will be conducted next year. South African President Cyril Ramaphosa has conceded that his government will not eliminate the current massive rolling blackouts in the short term. The president says the goal is to reduce the frequency and severity of power shortage and rampant cuts in the immediate term. Alleged Rwandan genocide financier Felician Kabuga will go on trial in The Hague one of the last key suspects in the 1994 ethnic slaughter that devastated the small East African nation. Kabuga's trial will open before a United Nations tribunal where he has been charged with genocide and crimes against humanity for his role in the murder of ethnic Tutsis 28 years ago. East Africa was thrown into a wild wind following the announcements by Ugandan health authorities of an Ebola outbreak that also claimed the lives of several people in the countries west of the capital Kampala. New Uganda Sudan Ebola virus outbreak means FDA licensed vaccine for Zaire Ebola virus cannot be used. That means that virologists and scientists have to go back to the drawing board and come up with a more stronger and efficient shield to this virus that has been classified as lethally fatal. Here now is a report. September the 20th, Mubende district goes into panic mode. It's this breaking news from Uganda's health ministry that set in motion the dramatic events in East Africa. When he reported to the hospital, he had the symptoms suspected to be of COVID. The patient was isolated, I mean Ebola. He was isolated. The sample was taken on 18th of September. The results came back yesterday evening to confirm the Ebola, the Sudan strain. Uganda, which shares a porous border with the Democratic Republic of Congo, has experienced several Ebola outbreaks in the past, most recently in 2019, when at least five people died. Realizing the severity and the worry that comes with the mention of Ebola, the Ministry and World Health Organization simultaneously issued these statements. WHO experts are on the ground working with Uganda's experienced Ebola control teams to reinforce diagnosis, treatment, and preventive measures. The Democratic Republic of Congo in August recorded a new case in its violence racked east. Less than six weeks after an epidemic in the country's northwest was declared over. Just in September 2021, Congo was among the last countries in Africa to declare victory over the battle to eradicate the virus. Today it gives us great joy to tell you that the Ebola virus disease has been defeated. In August 2021, a young Ghanaian woman who tested positive for Ebola virus in Ivory Coast after arriving there two weeks ago, recovered from the disease. 
Her diagnosis was the first confirmed case of Ebola in the Ivory Coast since 1994. The World Health Organization collaborated with the government in Ivory Coast, started a vaccination campaign to target those who were in immediate contact with the patient and security forces along the border with Guinea, and in a few weeks, the country was clear of the virus. We think that today we are safe from new cases, but we have to monitor this. Ebola is an often fatal viral hemorrhagic fever, first identified in 1976 in the DRC, then Zaire. The virus, whose natural host is the bat, has since set off a series of epidemics in Africa, killing around 15,000 people. Human transmission is through body fluids, with the main symptoms being fever, vomiting, bleeding and diarrhea. The worst epidemic in West Africa between 2013 and 2016 killed more than 11,300 people alone. DRC has had more than a dozen epidemics, the deadliest killing 2,280 people in 2020. The World Health Organization even celebrated the official end to the Ebola epidemic, which plagued the country for two years. The WHO says the Ebola Sudan strain is less transmissible and has shown a lower fatality rate in previous outbreaks than Ebola Zaire. Uganda is confident that much of the infrastructure used for COVID will be repurposed for Ebola. We have significant capacity built across within the country for detection and also to be able to galvanize community support and response. So we think that uh, using what we've done before, we should be able to, to appropriately respond to this current outbreak. Countries in the region, including Rwanda, Somalia, South Sudan and Kenya, have all stepped up screenings and checks at their borders. At present, there is no licensed medication to prevent or treat Ebola, although a range of experimental drugs are in development and thousands have been vaccinated in the DRC and some neighboring countries. Bureau Report, World of Africa. Nigeria has become the first country ever to announce a complete ban on foreign models and voice-over artists in television advertisements. The decision will be effective from October, and according to the government of Nigeria, this is an attempt to develop local talent. Here now is a report from Abuja. The advertising regulator of Nigeria has announced a ban on foreign models in TV and radio commercials. This, the regulator says, is in line with the federal government's policy of developing local talent and inclusive economic growth. According to the regulator, this step is aimed at growing the Nigerian advertising industry. For Margaret Elabi, an ex-model and creative director of Elabi Couture, it is a welcome development and a breath of fresh air. During my days of modeling, um, we've had experiences, I had experiences of having uh, to lose jobs, um, runway jobs, um, uh, advertisements, uh, you know, what have you, commercials, the calendar to international models you know they'll bring in i remember some let me not mention them some um established organization that now runs a, a you know um tv station radio station that were you know that were doing shows they would do, organize the fashion show then and they'll bring in international models you know and then we would have to uh they, they kind of made us inferior to these international models apart from paying us peanuts, paying us less than what we deserve. The Advertisers Council of Nigeria, however, called the ban on foreign voiceover artists and model a not well thought out decision. And the advertisers' body feels that such a ban is not only harmful to Nigeria and Nigerians, but also is discriminatory. My problem with uh, you know stopping foreigners to participate in modeling over here is the fact that what happens to 
cultural exchange. The truth is, we go to other places to film. We still carry our own characters. We still carry people that are models. And then we go there. Yeah, we include the place that we're going to. Probably South Africa, wherever country we go to. Same thing with Nigeria. I don't believe that they should be entirely banned. There are many within the industry, though, who think that there is nothing discriminatory about the law. Without saying, without a doubt, it's for the industry, it's a benefit for the industry that uh, we are looking inwards to groom our own talents, capacity building, hone them, provide platforms for them to, to thrive, and then they make money. And at the end of the day, too, you save for an exchange here. The Nigerian advertising industry was valued roughly at $450 million in 2021 and although it is not as big as the number of other African nations, it is believed that this move can boost its popularity. The ban by the Advertising Regulatory Council of Nigeria, Alcon, on the use of foreign models and the voice of artists in Nigerian commercial has come to stay. The recent announcement has been met with different reactions. While some practitioners see the move as a good one, others have halted the move. There is no gain saying that Nigerian models and creatives also enjoy cross-border work relationship. What becomes of this relationship? Louisa Olani from Lagos, Nigeria, World is One. Senegal, like other countries in the West and Central Africa region, has recorded above normal rainfall in recent weeks that has unleashed destructive floods. The deluge has breached a meters wide gap on the banks of Senegal's Pink Lake and washed away thousands of dollars worth of salt mounds gathered on the shores. The lake is one of the country's most visited sites and is under consideration as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Here's a report from Niaga, Senegal. After days of torrential rain, salt miner Babakarba could only watch in despair as flood waters breached a meters wide gap on the banks of Senegal's Pink Lake. The flood waters washed away thousands of dollars worth of salt mounds he had gathered. Senegal, like other countries in the West and Central Africa region, has recorded above normal rainfall in recent weeks. This has unleashed destructive floods after poor drainage systems failed. We work here and our whole life is about salt extraction. We support our families by working the salt. This is our only hope for survival. In this area of almost 20 meters, there was salt everywhere. The rainwater washed it away. The lake separated by a strip of dune from the Atlantic Ocean is situated around 35 kilometers from Senegal's capital, Dakar. It is one of the country's most visited sites and under consideration as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Officially known as the Lake Retba, it derives its pinkish hue from an algae that produces the colored pigment. And like the Dead Sea, it is also known for its high salt content. Ba is one of over 3,000 people who earn a living from the lake. Hundreds of divers rake salt from the bottom of the lake for a living, producing around 38,000 tons annually. Water came over the salt dunes and washed away everything. Those who can afford it pay excavators between $54 and $460 to move their salt, while others who cannot afford it pay women to do the work at a rate of around 8 cents and 15 cents per basin, depending on the distance. Over the past weekend, drainage systems and retention reservoirs quickly overwhelmed and channeled floodwaters towards the lake. As persistent rains drenched Senegal with around 126 millimeters recorded during one spell. According to Senegal's Civil Aviation and Meteorological Agency, rainfall above 50 millimeters in the country is considered extreme. With a month to go before the end of Senegal's June-October rainy season, other businesses around the lake, including restaurants and flat-bottom boat operators who take tourists on tours of the lake, are counting their losses and worried about the future. Today the people don't come anymore. I used to bring people here because we used to talk about the pink lake, about its color. 
for many, it is no longer worth coming anymore. Archaeologists have long told tales of brilliant foreign explorers uncovering the secrets of pharaohs. But the country is infuriated that Egyptians have been written out of the historical narrative. Ancient excavators say Egyptians did all the work, but were forgotten. They are now demanding that their contributions be recognized. In our is a report. This golden sarcophagus of the ancient Egyptian pharaoh Tutankhamun, who reigned between 1342 to 1325 BC, is on display in this burial chamber at the underground tomb in the Valley of the Kings, in Egypt's southern city of Luxor. Howard Carter, a British archaeologist, is believed to have discovered the intact tomb of the 18th dynasty pharaoh Tutankhamun on November of 1922. This is called the best preserved pharaonic tomb ever found in the Valley of the Kings. Flush with tales of brilliant foreign explorers uncovering the secrets of the pharaohs, Egyptians claim they have been relegated to the background. And now, ahead of the 100th anniversary of Carter's earth-shattering discovery, Egyptians are demanding that their contributions to the discoveries be recognized. According to specialist researcher Heba Abdul Gawad, even Egyptology's colonial era birth set neatly at Frenchman Jean Francois Champollion cracking the Rosetta Stone's code in 1822 whitewashes history. Those who documented the old Egyptian civilizations are foreigners, so we should understand that the writings were during the time of colonization and racism. That's why there is a kind of so-called whitewashing by creating a historic white narrative. Many specialists believe Egyptians remain unnoticed, unnamed and virtually unseen in their own history. But one Egyptian name did gain fame as the tomb's supposed accidental discoverer, Hussein Abdul Rizaul. Despite not appearing in Carter's diaries and journals, the tale of the water boy is presented as historic fact. On November 4th of 1922, a 12-year-old commonly believed to be Hussein found the top step down to the tomb, supposedly because he either tripped, his donkey stumbled or because his water jug washed away the sand. The next day, Carter's team exposed the whole staircase and on November 26th, he peered into a room filled with golden treasures through a small breach in the tomb door. Local farmers who knew the contours of the land could tell from the layers of sediment whether there was something there. Profound knowledge and skill at excavating had been passed down for generations in Kurna. Mustafa Abdul Sadak, a chief excavator of the Saqqara tombs near Giza, whose discoveries have been celebrated in the Netflix documentary series Secrets of the Saqqara Tomb, is a descendant of those diggers at Kift. His family moved 600 kilometers north at the turn of the 20th century to excavate the vast necropolis south of the Giza pyramids. Mustafa says his grandfathers and great uncles were wronged. However, few Egyptologists do not share the same view. There may have been certain behaviors which we may now describe as colonialism or consider wrong. But we can't generalize without good scientific research for at least five years at this point. While the contents of Tutankhamun's tomb stayed in Cairo, Egypt lost Carter's archives which were considered his private property. The records key to academic research were donated by his niece to the Griffith Institute for Egyptology at Britain's Oxford University. Unfortunately, until today, not only are the stolen antiquities in European museums, but also the production of knowledge on ancient Egypt, it is still limited to the Western academia circles. Over the centuries, countless antiquities made their way out of Egypt, some like the Luxor Obelisk in Paris and the Temple of Debord in Madrid. These were gifts from the Egyptian government. Others were lost to European museums through the colonial era apartheid system. Now, after 200 years of deciphering of the Rosetta Stone, Egyptians are bidding to reclaim their history. 
Bureau Report, World of Africa, we on World is One. After a three-year hiatus due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the legendary swimming race from Dakar to Gore Island finally made a comeback. More than 600 athletes of all ages took part in the crossing. Here's a report on why the Ocean Marathon in Senegal is symbolic. On the shores of the Atlantic Ocean, a unique race is about to take off in Senegal's capital, Dakar. Hundreds of swimmers are preparing to set off to Gori Island. Personally, I find that it was a little easier than the race we did from Dakar to Gore because you could easily see the posts to guide you and I really prefer it to the one that we usually did. First the professional swimmers, then it is the turn of amateurs, young and old. All jump into the ocean for the annual 5-kilometer water race to the former slave port where Africans were once sold and shipped off to slavery in the Americas. The race is a tribute to slavery victims who remained defiant and tried to swim often in chains for freedom. The race is in its 33rd edition. We really wanted to resume this activity and overall it went well. We had at least 650 on the participant side. Everyone swam and everyone finished. So Dakar Gori resumes and we hope by next year we will organize it better. Gori was a transit point over several centuries for enslaved Africans being shipped to the Americas. UNESCO designated it a World Heritage Site in 1978. These days, it's a popular tourist attraction with its cobblestoned streets and historic houses. The race is significant to the people of Senegal because it's a sign of honor to the slaves. The event consists of two separate races. Circuit A, a 5,200 meter course for professional swimmers starting from Gori Beach and a classic Circuit B race, which kicks off from the World York Beach with a distance of 4,500 meters. Bureau report, World of Africa. The Accra leg of Global Citizens Annual Music Festival held simultaneously with another concert in New York City was not your average show. African Global Citizen patrons have now urged the world to consider Africa's giving power in the future. Here now is a report from Ghana. <laughs> A nine-hour Global Citizen Festival 2022 was hosted across two stages, beginning in Black Star Square in Accra, Ghana, and ending in New York City's Central Park. The audience members received their tickets by participating in activism, such as beach cleanups, online petition distribution, and other activities. Ghanaians feel the event helps make the world a better place and that is what makes the Accra leg so unique. The world leading artists performed at the Glitzy Music Festival as the attendees danced, cheered and sang along. Ghanaians are very charitable people. We love like causes that end up in charity. We give and we, it's fun, it's fun. It's not always about giving to Africa. Africa can give and we can have fun too. I think for the longest time, what the African continent has always been portrayed, portrayed as is that we are economic burdens, but we're actually economic assets. Our culture is the current currency that is selling around the world. The annual concert showcases a diverse range of performers and celebrities such as Nomzamo Bata, Danai Gurira, rapper Stoneboy and others to light up the stage. The governments of Ghana and South Africa announced the African Prosperity Fund, a joint initiative which aims to deploy $1 billion to fund projects for economic inclusion and financial participation across the continent. The fund will benefit Africa's 1.3 billion people by concentrating on initiatives in the African continental free trade area such as infrastructural development, financial inclusion for women's and youth's involvement, education, healthcare, technology and sustainability. According to Global Citizens co-founder Michael, Ghana is a symbol 
of what Africa can achieve. And in poverty is not about charity. As is written on the arch, the independent arch here at Black Star Square, it's about justice, it's about equality, and it's about partnership. And together we can end extreme poverty. The end of Global Citizen Anti-Poverty Festival marked a major milestone for the initiative. Bureau Report, World of Africa. And that's Wild of Africa show for this week. Visit our website www.weonnews.com or our social media platforms on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram and YouTube to catch all our episodes. American Joker, thank you very much for watching. This is We On Wild Is One.